You're listening to the Option Alpha Podcast from OptionAlpha.com, where we show you how to make smarter trades, learn how the stock market really works, and generate consistent monthly income. Monthly income. Now, your host and head trader at OptionAlpha.com, Kirk Duplessis. Hey everyone, this is Kirk here again from OptionAlpha.com, working every single week to make this the most popular investing podcast offered online and in iTunes because it's based on one thing and one thing only, and that's helping you guys make smarter trades. So thank you so much again for tuning in today. On today's show, we are going to be covering a very interesting backtesting case study using weekly options. Yes, yes, yes. Everyone's so excited about weekly options. People are loving weekly options, but my concern with weekly options is that people are not using them the right way. And so what we're going to start doing is doing more of these backtesting case studies here on the podcast for you guys. And I hope you guys enjoy these. And if you do, please share with your friends and your family and coworkers, everybody you think that might be interested in this or gain a little bit of value out of it. So like I said, today's show is focused on a bull call spread in backtesting for DIA, which is the major Dow component ETF, basically. So it's the ETF that tracks all the Dow Jones components, very highly liquid. Everyone trades it. It's a very easy instrument to get in and out of. And where this kind of came out of, it was a conversation online that I was having with a member. And they said, well, why don't we just start, you know, because the markets are always so bullish and, you know, we can just frequently why don't we start trading weekly bull call spreads in the Dow or the S&P or IWM? And I was trying to tell them that even though we're trading weekly and we can adjust frequently, which I understand the logic behind that, if the market goes down, so what? It's just a weekly small trade and you can get into a new one next week, right? But with option buying, we're still paying the premium that requires that the market makes a huge move in the right direction all the time. And if it doesn't, meaning if it trades generally in a range as it's going up or as it's going down, then that means that these weekly options really start to lose their value very quickly. And so the gamma risk, the risk of the position either becoming very profitable or not profitable at all becomes insanely great. And so you have this movement back and forth, this pendulum from very profitable to unprofitable quickly in weekly options. It gives you really no time to adjust to current market environments and situations. So what I wanted to do is I want to prove this point by using some backtesting research that we just did in DIA. And we just used DIA as the guinea pig. We could have used basically anything, SPY, IWM, the Qs. I mean, a lot of these don't work in these bull call spreads, but DIA became the guinea pig for us to do a little bit of backtesting research on. So I want to give you guys the framework of how we set up this trade in DIA and then show you the two different scenarios that we ran, because I think generally using this concept will help as you guys are potentially buying options. Not that I definitely suggest it because you'll see it still is a losing strategy. But if you wanted to do it, maybe for a hedge purpose or just because you want to be speculative and want to be a rodeo cowboy for a couple days and try to gain a little bit of money out of the market, by all means, knock your socks off. But my, the goal here is just to help kind of prove this concept of uh, trading weekly options versus maybe like a longer dated option when buying. So the first one that we set up again was the 10 days to go until expiration using our backtesting software. Again, you can get access to this by just going to optionalpha.com slash toolbox and run your own analyses. We just ran one literally in 15 seconds here, but it was 10 days to go until expiration. So we were targeting the weekly contracts, which means that we're averaging around a 10 day expiration window. Sometimes the trades could have executed five days, seven days, 12 days, but around 10 days on average, right? We had no implied volatility rank minimum, which means that we didn't say to our software, hey, only make trades when implied volatility is above X level. Nope. We just said, you know what, let's just make these trades as often as we basically can at the 10 day to go till expiration mark. And the trade frequency that we used was weekly. So we said, you know what, let's just make a weekly trade every week, right? That makes sense. And that's what somebody was presenting to me when I was having this discussion back and forth online. They said, well, let's just make one trade per week, right? And if it's great because the market goes up, great. And if not, we have an opportunity to readjust and trade it again. So, okay. So we tested that. We tested the weekly frequency and we tested an overall allocation of 30%. So still small allocation for a whole portfolio like this, but assuming that people are going to get into it, it doesn't really matter if it was 30 or 20 or 50. It ended up being a loser regardless. But in this case, we tested overall allocation of 30% and we did test a profit exit of 50%. So we said to ourselves, okay, if we get a profit early in the 
weekly cycle. So in the first two days or first five days, or even in the last, you know, ninth day, we're going to take profits at 50%. So we're going to be opportunistic about taking money off the table, not letting our winners run, but actually cutting them off short and taking money off the table. A very similar concept we use on the option selling side, we're going to try to apply to the option buying side. And again, no stop loss level. We're going to try to take 50% profits or let it go to expiration. Now we did these spreads $5 wide. And the reason that we did them $5 wide is because we wanted to do a spread that was around where the current price of DIA was trading. So when we bought options, we used a long strike of a 60 delta. And so that means that we were buying options. Our long strike was a little bit in the money. And then on average, our out of the money strike or the short strike that we used was five strikes away. So it was a little bit further out of the money. So you can see we're trying to mimic you know, basically like a long stock position with frequent adjustments using option buying. And again, conceptually, a lot of this would make sense. You start to talk to people about this on the street, if you would, and then it makes sense conceptually. Why buy stock when you can just use options and repeat the process every single week? So you buy an option contract slightly in the money at a 60 delta, and then you sell an option contract five strikes away. So you're kind of straddling on top of the market, one option in the money, one option out of the money, break even price somewhere in between. That's got to work out, right? So here are the results of the back test that we did using the weekly contracts. Well, over the 10 year period, basically, the entire strategy blew up very, very quickly. In fact, it blew up early in the cycle. Now, that's mainly because during this time period, we saw the market have a crash, right? During this backtesting period. But that's bound to happen at some point in the future again. So, for those of you who might say, well, you tested it right before a crash. Well, tell me when you think another crash is going to happen, because I'll tell you that you don't know anything about when another crash is going to happen, and neither do I. So we can't ever use market crashes or market booms as our only frame of reference, because then we're skewing the data. If we test a bullish strategy just in a bullish environment, that skews the data. So we wanted to test this and say, look, during a down move and during an up move, what would happen to the strategy? Well, it ended up blowing up. Basically, the strategy had a negative 99.74% return, which basically means you lost money except for a little bit of maybe interest in cash. You had an annualized CAGR of negative 50%, a negative 0.85 sharp ratio, and basically a win rate overall of 52%. So you really didn't do much better than actually flipping a coin. In fact, just marginally better than actually flipping a coin. The average time that you were actually in the trade was about nine days. So you can see, depending on when we close out of the trades and when we, you know, I'll let them go to expiration and the, the expiration dates that we chose, you were actually in the trades about nine days. So it's very close to about a, a weekly contract as you can possibly get. That's nine calendar days, not nine trading days. So at the end here, you can see it wasn't very profitable. Again, if you would have started it even during the bottom of the market, it wouldn't have actually done well. It would have underperformed the market uh, significantly. So it doesn't really matter that we started it right before the market topped. So what we ended up doing is we ended up tweaking the strategy by one factor. So we changed one thing on the strategy and just decided to run it using maybe a longer dated option contract. And the reason that we talk about doing this is because if you're going to buy options, you want to give yourself enough time to be right. And now this doesn't mean that I'm a proponent of buying options. I am definitely not. So make sure you hear me on that. I'm not suggesting that you buy options. But if you're forced to do it, like if you have a Canadian account or something like that, a registered account in Canada, as we talked about in the last podcast, and you have to buy options, you want to buy them a little bit further out in time because you want to give yourself an opportunity for the market to come back around. And you want to have time decay, have a smaller impact on your option position, right? So you minimize that by buying contracts further out in time. Now, in this case, the only thing that we changed about the way that we ran this back test is the days till expiration that we targeted. We still entered trades every single week, but now instead of targeting the weekly contracts, we targeted trades that were two months out. So about 60 days to go till expiration. Again, this means that sometimes we would have entered trades 58 days, sometimes 62 days, but on average, we were targeting about 60 days to go until expiration. Everything else was the same. Long strikes at a 60 delta, spread width was $5, profit taking at 50%, no stop loss, no implied volatility ranking filter. Now this strategy still lost compared to the market, but did actually much, much better than absolutely blowing up your account. In this case, after the 10 year period, you only lost 42% as opposed to your entire account balance. 
you had an annualized Kager of 10%, a sharp ratio of negative 0.18, which again, compared to the other strategy means that you still lost money, obviously, but as far as risk and reward, so how much you got compensated for actually taking on risk, this type of strategy did a lot better as far as the actual sharp ratio, I had a higher sharp ratio, which means that you actually took on or you actually paid for the risk that you took on. In the last strategy, you basically weren't paid for the risk that you were taking on. You were taking on an insane amount of risk and you were never paid for it. In this case, it was a much better sharp ratio, which again proves that taking these longer dated option contracts when you're buying helps out dramatically. In this case, you had a 61% win rate, which was actually really surprising for me. I, I would not have thought that you would have had that high of a win rate. I would have initially thought it would have been around 55-ish, so marginally better. Again, we were still taking profits at 50%. But in this case, because you gave yourself more opportunity for the market to come back around, and eventually it did during this testing period as the market bottomed in 2009 and started to rally basically through 2016, you had an opportunity to uh, actually make some money in this and have a, a decent or make a little bit of money back and have a decent win rate in the process. Your average days in the trade were about 50 days. So even though we were targeting 60 days to go until expiration because we were taking trades off, we only ended up holding trades on an average about 50 days. And again, you still had really, really significant drawdowns. In fact, you went through multiple drawdowns of more than 20% during this process. Now, what saved this strategy, and I say air fingers quotes, saved this strategy was the fact that the markets did bottom and rally strong in 2009 and 2010, 11, and 12. The strategy actually started to fail miserably, which is kind of surprising but it's because of implied volatility started to fail miserably as we got towards 2015 and 2016. And that's just because the gamma risk just became too great and the market wasn't going as high as fast every week. It was kind of slowly grinding higher. So your position just basically continued to lose money. So it's a very interesting little case study. Hopefully it helps out and just, again, understanding some of these dynamics that happen in the market. I don't ever fault people for coming to me with a reasonable expectation of what they think should happen. So in this case, this person that uh, basically spawned this whole discussion and podcast on this case study, you know, they came to me and they, you know, were, we were chatting back and forth online and, you know, their points were very rational, like why they should do it. They had really thought it out. But again, more so than just, you know, like some of these rational points, you've got to back test some of these strategies to make sure that they actually work. And in this case, I sent this to this person, you know, in this one-off chance and said, hey, look, you know, like I back tested this. This is why it doesn't work, right? Because they were just, you know, hounding me and they're like, how come it doesn't work? How come it doesn't work? And I was trying to tell them like it doesn't work for this and this and this and this reason. And here are the results, right? Now, just for full disclosure, if everyone starts emailing me asking me to back test, I'm not going to do that, right? So that's like a one-off thing that I do for coaching and other people. But you can obviously purchase access to the Toolbox software online. You can back test as many of these as you want. And we'll keep updating the data in there with new market data so it's always fresh and always relevant. But just like 10 or 15 seconds of actually running these back tests can make a huge difference in your account. Because if you're thinking about doing this strategy, and hopefully if you thought about it before today's podcast, now you think that you should definitely not do the strategy. Just imagine what other strategies you can find in there that actually turn turn out to be really, really good performers compared to the market. And they are definitely in there because we've written reports on them and we do them on, on our side too. So again, hopefully you guys enjoyed today's little case study with these DIA weekly bull call spreads here and the backtesting results. As always, if you guys thought that this was helpful, please share it online. Please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast. That always helps out, helps spread the word about what we're trying to do here at Option Alpha. So let's get into the Trader Q&A segment. And now our favorite part of the show, Trader Q&A, where we ask a question from one of our current members about options trading. Got a question you'd like to ask Kirk to answer live on the air? Just head on over to optionalpha.com forward slash ask and hit the record button to leave a message. That's optionalpha.com forward slash ask. And now, here's today's question. Hey, Kirk. My name is Randy. I'm from Texas, and I've been trading for two years. My question is, when we ladder into multiple positions as the stock moves up or down, is it better to look at each individual trade or the position as a whole? Which way do you think is most profitable or less risky and why? 
All right, so Randy, thank you so much for submitting the question. So again, when we're laddering into positions and laddering basically just means for those of you who don't know that concept that we use, it's spreading our trade entry out over time. So instead of entering one position of say 20 contracts, we might spread that out and do five contracts and then five a couple days later and five a couple days later, et cetera. And so when we do ladder into positions, we look to manage those trades generally individually versus as a whole. And the reason that we do that is because the whole technique of laddering is to try to take advantage of different price points in the market, basically averaging up or averaging down with wherever the stock is going. So as the market moves, some positions, if we say say we have four positions on four different strike prices or strike price ranges let's say the market moves up, then that might give us an opportunity to take off uh, two of those trades. And then the market moves down slightly and we take off one more trade. And then the market moves back up and we're able to take off the fourth trade that we got into, right? So it's being opportunistic when you, I think, manage these positions individually versus if you said, okay, I want this whole thing to make me 50%. Well, you may not get an opportunity to have the whole thing make you 50%. Some months you might get three out of four trades that are winners and I'm still good with that, right? Like that's 75% of my trades that end up working out because we laddered into them. So I think it's a lot better to manage these positions individually. Now, when we ran backtesting analysis, and this is why I tell people all the time, backtesting shows a lot of profitable strategies and all of those strategies were run using the individual analysis of each trade. So each individual trade was closed at a profit target versus the summation of the whole. Each individual trade was, you know, closed using a stop loss versus the summation of the whole if you ran it using stop losses. So even though we don't have really the capacity in there to sum up all these trades and constantly manage a whole position, managing them individually actually ended up working out really, really well. And when we release our backtesting software, or sorry, with the release of our auto trading software, you have the ability to do that as well with auto trading software is have the bots basically manage each position like its own little independent island or own little independent, you know, kind of soldier going out there and making trades for you. So I think that's the better way to go for sure. It's obviously the easier way to go. It doesn't get confusing with adding up all the strikes and adding up all the credits and debits. It's a lot better to just enter a trade and then go right back in and use automation to get the trade closed or manage the position as you see fit. So as always, hopefully you guys enjoy these. If you do have a question that you want us to answer live on the podcast or on Facebook or the daily call podcast that we have, we are always looking for more submissions. We would love to get some more content and get this queue really lined up for the rest of the year. So please head on over to optionalpha.com slash ask and click the big red button in the middle of the screen and leave me a private voicemail. Again, there's no software to download or install and it's incredibly easy. So let's get into the closing bell segment. Now, the closing bell. Find out which stocks we're looking at right now, trades we're making, and hear our game plan moving forward. All right, so in today's closing bell segment, I want to do something a little bit different. And I wanted to specifically talk about a trade that we put on in DIA. So, yes, we are talking about DIA, the same DIA that we were talking about earlier in the podcast when we referenced all of the bull call spreads in the Dow, right? And so now what we're going to do is we're going to take the total opposite side of this trade because we know now that buying bull call spreads is something that's not profitable. So we're going to sell a call spread in the Dow. And this is a bearish call spread because we're selling options out of the money here on the Dow and hopefully looking for the Dow to make a move lower. Now, for full disclosure, as always, when we get into a lot of these trades, what we end up doing for these podcasts is we end up talking about trades as we're recording these and then these get released later on in the future. So the trade that we've made by the time that this goes out always is sent out to our pro and elite members first. So if you want to get access to these trades earlier on or when we get these trades in, they, we send out emails and text messages to our pro and elite members. You can go ahead and sign up at optionoff.com slash upgrade. But again, in this case, with the time that we were trading this, by the time that we made this trade in the Dow, the Dow was trading around around 239 or so. And so with the Dow trading around 239, just had a big down day today. Looks like we might continue at least for the time being a little bit of a down move in the market. And so for that reason, we're selling the out of the money call credit spread in the Dow. Now, in this case, our portfolio does need a little bit more bearish exposure. So this kind of hits two birds with one stone. We are looking for 
uh, a position where we want to sell options in the Dow, and we also need a bearish position, so it accomplishes both missions here. But with the Dow trading around 239, we're selling the 252 call options and then buying the 255 call options for a $56 credit. Now, doing this about 52 days out from expiration, I think is a pretty good trade. It's not the ideal range. We honestly don't like to trade around 50 days, but given that we need to get a little bit more balance in our portfolio and get some bearish exposure, uh, this should be a good position just to balance out the other things that we have in our account. And even if the Dow does turn around and reverse and move higher, it's got to close back above 252 for us to lose on this trade. So it's trading at 239 right now, so it's got to reverse all the way back around another 10 plus point reversal and close back above 252, which it looks like there's about a 75% chance that that's not going to happen based on implied volatility and option pricing right now. So this is a very high probability trade for us. Again, we want to sell options a little bit further out, take a super high probability trade like this and add it to our portfolio to give us some bearish exposure. As always, we'll try to manage this around a 50% profit target or somewhere in there, depending on what our portfolio makeup looks like at that time. But I think it's going to be a good trade. So we'll obviously have to see how it works out in the future. Thanks for listening to the Option Alpha podcast. If you liked what you heard, please drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. Plus, you can get everything. Free email updates for future shows, transcripts, video tutorials, case studies, and more. Just visit our website at optionalpha.com. All right, so I truly hope you guys enjoyed today's show and as always got at least one thing out of it that you can apply right now to make you a smarter, more profitable trader and investor. As always, you can get additional resources, some links mentioned in the show and some related video training on today's show about bull call spreads and options backtesting by going to optionalpha.com slash show 133. Again, that's just the number 133, optionalpha.com slash show 133. Until next time, happy trading.